This month, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the English Standard Version, first published by Crossway in 2001. To help mark this milestone, we're releasing a number of fascinating interviews focused on the ESV and Bible translation. Today, we're pleased to share another of these interviews, a conversation with ESV Translation Oversight Committee member, Dr. Jack Collins, on translating the Old Testament. Jack and I discuss why all Bible translation entails trade-offs, what it means to read and translate the Old Testament literally, and a whole lot more. In addition to his work on the ESV Translation Oversight Committee, Jack serves as Professor of Old Testament at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. He's also the author or contributor to a number of books and Bibles, including Did Adam and Eve Really Exist? and the ESV Study Bible. Let's get started. Well, Jack, thank you so much for joining me today on the Crossway Podcast. Well, I appreciate you having me. It's good to be with you. So today we're going to talk about uh, a variety of facets related to the process of translating the Old Testament into English, into our English Bibles. And uh, we're talking with you because you served as Old Testament chairman on the Translation Oversight Committee for the ESV. And I want to get into that role, what that entailed, what your work was like there. But before we do that, I have to ask a little bit more about your background. Uh, I saw that you have a Master of Science from MIT. Uh, I wonder if you could share a little bit more about what that was about. Sure. Well, my, uh, my first training was in engineering at MIT at the bachelor's and master's level, and I worked for several years uh, as a research engineer in the Boston area before I went to seminary. And then in seminary, I just fell in love with the biblical languages, and that's why I went on to do a Ph.D. in ancient Semitic languages. Mm. And so what kind of engineering were you involved with? What was the work actually focused on? Uh, uh, mostly it was uh, what's called systems engineering, um, which actually for Bible translation makes a big difference um, because most people aren't accustomed to thinking in terms of systems. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the overall system is what has to work well, and each individual part might not be doing the absolute best that it could, but it's the way that it fits with the whole system. Uh, actually, we just had the Olympics, and if you uh, think about the all-round uh, Olympics uh, for gymnastics, um, there's a young lady who lives across the street f uh, from me who is the state champion in her uh, age bracket as the as the all-round gymnast, and uh, she isn't going to necessarily place first in every single one of the events, but the overall uh, production is uh, is superior to everybody else's. And uh, in a Bible translation, that's also what we're seeking to do. It's, it's uh, what you can call a, a global uh, concern. Namely, we want the whole thing to work together. And, and that means, of course, that you, that, uh, you have trade-offs. And most people aren't accustomed to thinking about trade-offs and cost-benefit uh, things and so forth. Um, so I actually found that my engineering background helped me in... in um, preparing for a Bible translation. Hmm. We have a particular philosophy of translation which uh, might or might not dictate what we do in a particular place, just depending on how it relates to everything else that's going on. Hmm. Well, and we're going to come back to some of those details in a minute, but uh, you, you mentioned that sometimes there are trade-offs, uh, and that that's kind of a concept that you got from the systems engineering background that you had. Uh, but I wonder if you could speak to that really briefly on the issue of translating, because I, I would imagine most people would think, you know, you've got your Hebrew text sitting in front of you, and you've got maybe a, a verse that you're trying to translate, and you're just going to make the right decision, the best decision for that passage, uh, kind of in isolation, and then you move on to the next one. So that, why would there ever be a time when you feel like you'd have to make a trade-off uh, when it comes to translating the Bible? Um, well, a, a real simple example is in uh, the, the situation of repeated words. So uh, very often biblical writers will repeat words or related words. So a word like salvation uh, as a noun and the verb to save and so on. And um, 
the if you can capture the repetition you you get a sense of how the whole passage hangs together or how this passage hangs together with other passages but it might not have been the thing that you would have chosen if you were just looking at the individual sentence in which it occurs so you sacrifice a little bit of um eh, call it a little bit of discomfort with this at the sentence level in order to secure something mm. at the larger level of making visible these repetitions to the English reader. Mm. That's so interesting. Would you say that it's fair to say that translating is, there is an art to it then? It's not always a, a super, super clear cut, you know, I know exactly what word this should be every single time? Uh, that's right. To do a good translation uh, requires a lot more than, than simply cranking it out Mm. Um, and so I mean that people have done studies with computerized translation and the one thing that a computer doesn't have is a feel for the situation Mm. so interesting so maybe uh, jumping back to your your educational background so you said you you did this work at MIT and then you went on to get an MDiv I believe from Faith Evangelical Lutheran Seminary in Washington State um, and that was where you kind of got introduced to the languages. But what was it about the biblical languages that were so interesting to you? Again, coming from this science background, it feels like a pretty pretty stark difference there. Well, I've always had a love for languages, and so the prospect of learning uh, more languages has always appealed to me. So at just on a strictly human level, <laughs> I simply enjoy it. You're one of those people that, that many, most of us don't fully understand the thought of trying to learn another language is... <laughs> well, and, and uh, well, what can I say? <laughs> I, I'm told that, that I have a pretty good ear for the sounds in other languages, huh. and I usually can pick things up and find a way to say something embarrassing in a language that somebody <laughs> is teaching me. So that's that's yeah. my gift, I suppose. Yeah. So then what? when was it, though, that you made that turn from just appreciating those languages, enjoying studying uh, biblical Greek and Hebrew, to then actually saying, I think I want to go on to do a, a PhD, I believe from uh, Liverpool, uh, University of Liverpool in England, in these ancient languages? I don't really know the answer to that. It just, it was a, it was something that, that dawned on me eventually that, I, I felt that I was good at, at this, and perhaps by being good at it, that was some level of guidance from God. Mm. And then the opportunity opened up for me to go, uh, and so it's really that simple. Yeah, and did you think that you would be involved in a Bible translation project You know, when you first started that work? No, never. Uh, I never would have dreamed of that. Mm. So how did you get connected then to the, the English Standard Version? Well, I was minding my own business. I think it was something, I was doing something with my kids one evening, uh, and I had a phone call from Wayne Grudem, uh, whom I knew by reputation, but not personally, and he uh, phoned me up and, and asked me what I consider it, and he had been in contact with one of my colleagues, uh, or actually at the time it was a former colleague who was then one of his colleagues at Trinity, um, who had said, yeah, you should, you should get in touch with this guy. Mm. So it's just, that's, it's really that simple. I, I didn't volunteer. I didn't know anybody was talking about me. I just had this phone call. I believe it would have been in the fall of 1998. Yeah. And what was it initially that drew you to the project? I, I would have to imagine that working on a translation project like the ESV, it's, it's a big undertaking. Uh, it, it entailed a lot of hours of, of hard work, both independently and together as a committee. So, so what was it that compelled you to, to consider doing that? Well, several things. One is that uh, I'd, uh, before being a seminary professor, I was a, a church planting pastor. Um, and so I was using a Bible translation that was oriented towards easy intelligibility. But I was finding it difficult to use that translation in my public ministry because I didn't always agree with it or I didn't feel that the translator that the translators had an eye towards these like these global concerns and Mm. and so on and it was very frustrating for me to say well the Bible in your lap says X but it would have been better had they said something else Um, I, I I don't think that's a healthy situation for people to feel that that uh, their minister is 
you know, the, the only reliable voice of God. Uh, I, I don't think that's good for the ministry. I don't think that's good for the congregation. I don't think that's good for anybody. Um, mm. So there was that. But then, um, so just a little bit after that phone call, and we were getting into the Advent season, and so I was reading Bible passages for my kids. Both of my kids were born in the early 90s, so you can imagine their sort of very early school age. And um, uh, so I was reading to them from one of the uh, very dynamic Bible translations where the shepherds were to go and look for an infant wrapped in baby clothes. Um, <laughs> And my children objected immediately, and they, they were convinced that, that I was pulling their legs, that, no, that's not the Bible. Mm. Um, and, and I realized, okay, so kids actually do uh, have this sense of what's the real Bible. Um, and, and the kids don't want the Bible to speak as if it were written in 2000 or now in 2021. They, they want it to be the ancient document that it is. Hmm. So, so my kids actually convinced me that um, we need uh, a, a Bible translation like what the ESV set out to be. Yeah, and how would you summarize uh, just briefly what that that goal for the ESV was uh, when you all first started work on it? Well, we've we've used a lot of different terminology. Um, transparent translation, essentially literal, and, and so forth. But uh, let, let me put it in different terms. I, I want you, when you read the Bible, to recognize both that it comes from an ancient and foreign setting, but also that it is relevant to you here and now. Um, and so I, I do want you to be able to go on a journey to ancient Palestine or uh, to ancient Mesopotamia or to ancient Athens uh, when you read the Bible, um, but uh, to, read, uh, to, to read it in a way that it begins to make sense why it's relevant to you mm. right here and right now. And I would venture to guess that most you know, modern-day evangelical Christians in America, we kind of intuitively understand the latter part of that, of what you just said, that we want to see how the Bible is relevant and applies to us today and now. That just feels very, very core to who we are as evangelical Christians. But why would you say it's important to, to actually start that journey by going back into the ancient times, like you just said? Well, um, just uh, simply historically, the Bible comes from that ancient setting and speaks about things in that ancient setting. Uh, and it's upon us to learn uh, about that ancient setting. The climate in Palestine is different from the, Pal the, from the climate here in St. Louis or in England. Uh, I'm, I'm, my, theologically, I'm akin to the Puritans, and a lot of uh, Puritan imagination, say, about the scenes in the Bible, are, uh, transpose those scenes into the English countryside. Mm, yeah. Um, and, I mean, that's fine for what they're trying to do, but that is not going to further your understanding of what the biblical text uh, was doing in its own original mm. setting. Uh, and then theologically, um, I would say, look, uh, God chose to give his word in particular languages at particular times, and, and he has placed us, the readers here in the 21st century, in the position not of the original audience, uh, of those biblical texts, but we are heirs of those first audiences. And so the, th the things that the uh, Bible writers would have said to those first audiences, they might or might not be saying to us, depending on what our condition is. Mm. Um, it, in Leviticus, for example, there are prohibitions about the kinds of foods that the people of ancient Israel are allowed to eat or not allowed to eat. Uh, most Christians will agree that those prohibitions don't apply to us in, in exactly the same way. There are some Christian groups that do want to apply those, but most Christians would say, okay, so we're not prohibited from uh, eating pork like the ancient Israelites were. So we want to recognize, uh, as, a, as a Christian, I want to recognize what those prohibitions were doing in ancient Israel um, so that I can appreciate how that has a bearing on me. To say that uh, 
that they had a bearing primarily for the first audience doesn't leave me out. It it lays me under an obligation to understand what it means to be an heir of all that. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's so good. When it comes to the the work on the ESV that you did, uh, as I've already mentioned, you were uh, you served as Old Testament chairman. Uh, what exactly did that role entail, and was that something that you were initially brought into, or that you eventually uh, took on as time went on? Uh, that that was from the very get go. I I was the the chairman, and the original idea was to have a fairly small group, and we would make a small number of revisions to the Revised Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version from uh, nine, I think in 1951 or so, and. The, the uh, new Revised Standard Version was already in existence for about 10 years, but we weren't going to try to reproduce what that had done, but to go in a more, call it a more biblically conservative direction. Um, and But then we realized there's more to it than that. Mm. Uh, and so then I needed to recruit uh, more members of, of the committee. Um, so we ended up with a committee of well, initially a committee of three, and then we expanded it to include another. Um, and then we had to divide up the uh, the biblical books amongst ourselves, who would be who would be primarily responsible for these particular books, and so on. And so our basic procedure was uh, we would take the text of the RSV, and uh, we would just simply go through it verse by verse, comparing it to the biblical texts, the the Hebrew and uh, the Greek. What what and, biblical and, or what Hebrew text were you using when it came to the Old Testament? Well, the 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 standard Hebrew text is the uh, uh, Biblica Hebraica Stuttgartensia (BHS) as it's called. Th- there are other editions of the Hebrew Bible. They they vary almost not at all. Mm. Um, and so uh, basically any any one of the standard Hebrew texts that, that somebody would have would, would be the same thing. But the BHS was our, that, that was our standard, just like it is for most academics nowadays. Mm. Um, and uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, the, one of the things I was looking for was certainly if, if there were places where the, the uh, critical inclinations of the RSV translators had perhaps led them to say um, to tone down something that that's in the Bible something that's strange or odd or in some cases to offer a, a a revised reading that that they thought oh it must have been changed in transmission and so forth um, our goal was mostly as much as possible to represent the Hebrew text um, as much as we could and with a few places where we thought yeah there's a pretty good case for uh, for a revised reading but the RSV thought there were a lot of places mm. where the case was good so we were looking at those things and then um, we, we were learning as we were going we, we were we were recognizing okay so there are certain repetitions we learned this very on very early on in Genesis in Genesis 3.15, the woman's seed, as it's traditionally rendered, um, in most uh, modern English versions, it would be the women's children, perhaps, or her descendants. Uh, and the word offspring in English actually presented itself as being, as having the same challenge as the English word seed. Um, the seed that that word can be a particular seed or it can be a collective for a bunch of seeds Mm. and likewise the english word offspring just when you use it so the woman's offspring is it one particular offspring or is it her offspring in general well we didn't think that it was the job of the translators to decide that um and so that uh because different commentators will take different perspectives on that but it turns out that the term offspring is uh, repeated quite a few times in the book of Genesis, and that actually throughout the Bible, coming up into the New Testament as well. Um, and we thought it was worthwhile as much as we could to allow people to see that the offspring of the woman, then you have the offspring of Abraham, mm. uh, and and then ultimately Jesus is the offspring of David. Um, if if we could allow that to show through, we tried. Yeah, you couldn't su- you couldn't succeed in every case, but but it was a goal anyway. That's such an interesting example too. That um, 
in that case, am I hearing you correctly that there was ambiguity with the the Hebrew word that's translated offspring, the ambiguity as to is this a single person or is this uh, multiple descendants or other descendants? And so in that case, you were trying to maintain the ambiguity of the original text in, in the English translation. Right. Uh, and ambiguity, I mean, for some people, ambiguity is a pejorative word. Right. So I, I would say that, that it requires you to make a decision mm. um, and, or, or to make a discernment, if, if you like. So you, it's, so it's a required discernment, is it uh, like in Genesis 3.15? Uh, I think it's a particular offspring based on the grammatical structure there. Not everybody agrees with that. Um, and the, the, uh, it, it isn't a purely... Um, uh, it, it isn't purely residing in the meaning of the word that we translate offspring. There's there's other factors. So, the the responsibility to decide then is thrown onto the English reader. Mm, yeah. So we want to we want to allow the English reader the same opportunities to make discernments as were there for the original Hebrew and Greek readers. Mm, yeah. Uh, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit then more broadly to the, the question of the Hebrew language. I think to, to most Christians uh, who have not studied uh, ancient Hebrew or ancient Greek, you know, all we know of our Bibles is an English translation or maybe multiple English translations that we've used and, and grown accustomed to and maybe grown to love and cherish. Um, but help us understand a little bit more about the dynamics of ancient Hebrew. Uh, what are some things that modern Christians should know about that language? Well, the first thing to say about it is that it was a living language that was spoken every day. Uh, and I, I tell my students, look, there's two-year-olds in Jerusalem that are speaking this language, so there's no excuse for you not learning it either. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's a spoken language, but then in the Bible what you have uh, is a, a sort of higher level of the language than the everyday, it's and and it's in the right, written form, and it's a, in a written form so that it can be read aloud in the gathered worship assemblies of the people of Israel, and then you'd have a priest expounding it and so forth. So there's a level of call it formality. I, mm. I wouldn't like to use the word artificiality, but it's not exactly the same as everyday. Hebrew speech. It's, it's uh, a little bit separate from that. How do, how do we know that about ancient Hebrew? How do we know that this wasn't exactly what they would have been speaking to each other? Well, um, part, part of it is inference, and part of it, there, there are a few inscriptions uh, and so forth that, that have uh, been turned up. There aren't a whole lot, uh, but there are a few. Uh, but, but from the Bible itself, it's indicated what its function is. It's mm. to be read aloud in the gathered congregation. And from the perspective of sociolinguistics, that means you expect that kind of language to be a little bit different from, uh, from the everyday. Uh, for example, it won't change as fast as the everyday speech will. Um, I mean, just putting it in writing sort of means that, that it won't change as fast. Uh, and... Um, so, for example, a modern student, um, you know, here in 2021, a, a person who's a college graduate coming to seminary, uh, I have them read the writings of C.S. Lewis, for example, but, um, but those were written in the 1940s uh, or 1950s, and um, that's the, the, the English, and, the, and it's English English as opposed to American English, there's already getting to be a bit of a distance uh, mm. between... The, the current kind of speech and that that sort of speech. But had had those things been sort of presented regularly in people's hearing, you you wouldn't have the same kind of difficulty. Mm. Um, and so that's 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 the phenomenon that you have in the Bible. So it changes much more slowly. It, it does change. So you, you do have later books that, where the Hebrew is a little bit different, not totally different, but a little bit different. Uh, and then after the time, uh, uh, the, the end of the writing of the books in the canon, Hebrew is still a spoken language, and it's still a spoken language in the time of Jesus, although it has changed. Uh, and then it develops into the language that was used uh, amongst the Jewish rabbis uh, in the, uh, the collection called the Mishnah and various other resources. Uh, and then that, of course, has a relationship to the Hebrew that is spoken in Israel today. 
to say it has a relationship is definitely not to say that it's the same, but there's some level of continuity there. Mm. So, so it, it was a it was a living and spoken language, but the writings in in the Bible sort of freeze the language, um, and so they they exercise what's called a linguistic conservatism. That is to say, it, we're preventing change, the natural change from happening in order to freeze it in this text here, um, and so just the nature of that language is already taking them back to the time of their ancestors. Hmm. It's something that I heard a lot when I was in grad school and I've heard other pastors testify to the same dynamic is that as a student learning biblical Greek and Hebrew for the first time, uh, Greek is a little easier to maybe pick up right away and quickly, but that eventually Hebrew, uh, although maybe the, the learning curve is steeper at first, it's ultimately an easier language to grasp and to kind of get further in. Do you resonate with that? Is there, how would you rate the two languages and how hard they are to learn? Yeah, I think um, that's, that's probably correct. Um, the, the reason is that uh, Greek has um, a lot more complexities to it. Um, you have multiple uh, patterns for the nouns, um, uh, for the noun cases. You've got uh, three declensions for the nouns. Uh, that didn't bother me because I had I had been a Latin student in my high school days where you have five declensions, so <laughs> three seemed like a uh, like a nice break. Um, and then the the, uh, the system of the verb and so forth um, was is a little bit more challenging in Greek, um, but but at least for a native English speaker, what's going on in Greek is a little bit more recognizable, a little bit more intuitive. In Hebrew, there are just different kinds of grammatical patterns, um, and the way the verbs work uh, is a little bit different. Um, <clears throat> and actually, there are multiple theories out there still. Um, that there would be only one theory if everybody came to me and asked me what I think, but <laughs> since they don't all come to me, there are multiple theories out there, and, and so it kind of depends on which textbook you're using you know exactly how you understand the the verbs in Hebrew. I, I think we're sort of narrowing down on on a, a fairly good consensus nowadays. But um, so yeah, some of the grammatical structures. Then of course the vocabulary. Um, I mean everybody has heard the word shalom. Uh, everybody's heard the word amen or amen. Um, hardly anybody. I mean we've all heard the word hallelujah. But hardly anybody in English knows that hallelujah is actually a plural imperative, where hallelujah is addressed to a group of people, and I'm inviting them to praise Yah, mm -hmm. or, or the Lord. Um, and so, you know, we have a number of borrowed terms in English, but we don't really know w what to do with them or, or what they're supposed to mean. Um, I mean, w when I was a new Christian and, I, and I'd find a parking place in Boston, which is difficult, after I'd been praying, <laughs> God, please bring me to a parking spot, and I'd find one, and I'd say, hallelujah. Um, right. Well, that's, that's actually not grammatical uh, to the Hebrew, um, and, and I probably should have just said it in English. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so when it comes to the Old Testament, I, my sense is there are a number of issues that are often raised uh, that often have this apologetic side to them. Uh, there are some issues with the Old Testament that we, as Christians, sometimes wrestle with and will be challenged on, and, and some of them relate to this issue of the original text, the original Hebrew, and I wanted to explore a couple of those with you today. Uh, the first one relates to that question of, uh, or the, the topic of textual criticism, which you already kind of referenced briefly, and then e even authorship. Uh, I wonder if you could unpack that. What is textual criticism, and how does that come into play when it comes to translating uh, the Old Testament? So uh, textual criticism is, is the, the word criticism may, may trouble some people. It's simply evaluating the reading of a text. So um, just to give a simple example, I, I have an edition of the Sherlock Holmes stories that was printed in... Uh, what was then Czechoslovakia in the 1980s. Uh, and so every now and then there is something that looks funny, uh, and, I'm, and I have a right to suppose that it's because the proofreader uh, in Prague, or wherever he was, didn't understand the English word. Because mm. um, it's in so English. This is an English it, It's That's right. An English edition. Oh, right. 
it's that's right the the english edition of the sherlock holmes stories and so i'd find something that was spelt b-r-o-u-g-h and there's supposed to be a t on it um but obviously the proofreader didn't know that but then then you get to some words that where even the misspelling is still an english word like thought and though uh again just missing a t at the end uh and so i make a judgment hmm i think thought uh, was probably what Conan Doyle wrote here. So that's that's what textual criticism is. I'm looking at a reading in a text, and I'm, and especially when I have a difficulty with it, I think, well, maybe the difficulty is because it didn't get transmitted correctly. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one way to do it would be to go and find a printing of the text, say, that was closer to the time of Conan Doyle, and, that, and it had been printed in London rather than in Prague. Um, and so that's a resource for textual criticism. It's a it's a check. Uh, that that was wasn't intended to be to be a pun, but I guess it is. Um, <laughs> the uh, um, <clears throat> and so uh, when when you have multiple manuscripts uh, of a text, you can compare those manuscripts, and you are assessing okay, which of those seems to be closer, in my best judgment, closer to what the author actually wrote. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, we don't we don't have the same situation as we do in the apostolic writings. In the New Testament, we have multiple attestations of the Gospels or the letters of Paul or whatever, uh, and um, so we can sift them. And, and um, if if you look at a what's called a critical edition of the New Testament, uh, at the the foot of the page, that there'll be a lot of uh, material there on alternate readings. Uh, when you're looking at the Hebrew Bible, you don't have the same kind of situation. You don't have multiple alternate readings in Hebrew texts. Um, it, it's changing a little bit be, because of certain discoveries like the Dead Sea Scrolls and the... the um, uh, um, I'm, I'm blanking on, on the word, uh, the, uh, the text from Syria, from the synagogue in Syria. But... Um, <clears throat> We, but we also have ancient translations, the, the Greek translation, the Septuagint, and then Jerome's translation, the Vulgate, and so forth. And it's possible that they might be testimony to a different reading. It's possible, but, but good text, textual criticism says, yeah, but there might be other explanations. So you got to look at all the possible explanations. So every now and then, you know, you see, uh, so for example, a Hebrew verb is inflected, that is to say it has a different ending depending on whether its subject is masculine or feminine. Hmm. Um, and so so if I, if I were speaking to you, I would use the masculine form. If I were speaking to my daughter, I would use the feminine form. And so every now and then it looks, you know, you'll, you'll encounter a text where you'd expected to see the masculine form and there's the feminine form. So uh, what, what do we do with this? Well, um, either there's something going on that I don't understand or there might, be, there might have been some difficulty in the transmission of the text. So you have to make, a, make some kind of discernment there. Mm. And so criticism just means evaluation. You consider the possibilities and you make your best judgment. Yeah. And how does that then, how does that work relate to the question of authorship? I think sometimes those two, these two topics are kind of linked together in some way. But authorship is a big question about certain sections of the Old Testament. Uh, well, uh, b before I address that, let me let me point out that uh, if you talk to anybody from an Islamic perspective, uh, they they will tell you that there is no textual criticism needed for the Quran, uh, because because God has preserved it whole and and intact completely, uh, and so the the very fact that that Jews and Christians do textual criticism is evidence that their scriptures are not as fully inspired as the Quran is, mm. um, and as it turns out, there is actual textual variation in the Quran tradition, but but then secondly, the um, the kinds of variations, especially in the Hebrew Bible, are extremely small, uh, and and of no significance for the most part, um, and then and and then thirdly, uh, what we have is a different perspective on the human being. Um, uh, I, the, the biblical situation 
uh, honors human beings with the responsibility to make these assessments and to do their best job. And, and Islam, uh, in, in that approach towards text, textual criticism, is really, I think, demeaning uh, the, the human being. So uh, from the apologetic side, I don't think that it's actually a difficulty, as some of our Islamic friends uh, would like to make it out to be. Mm. Uh, we, we had a visitor, an imam from Iran, at our fa- one of our faculty meetings a number of years ago, uh, and he asked this very question. And uh, the seminary president, uh, we were all cl- caught flat-footed when um, the seminary president said, well, I think Dr. Collins would like to answer that question. <laughs> so so I've, I've been stewing on that ever, ever since. Yeah. But, yeah. So, so then speak, speak to the issue of authorship. I think that's, in my experience, uh, a related issue that's often brought into conversations related to textual criticism of the Old Testament. Right. Uh, well, um, it, it's, there, um, there, there's a higher level than, than just the, the reading of the text. There's, there are the literary features of the text and how does the text hang together. Uh, and um, starting around the year 1800 or so, I mean, I'm just using rough, rough terms here, uh, people began paying attention to what they thought were discontinuities in the text or irregularities. It doesn't seem like the same author is speaking when you go from the end of chapter 2 to the beginning of chapter 3 uh, of, you know, some particular text. So maybe maybe chapter 2 and chapter 3 have different authors, and somebody just sort of slammed them together and never really smoothed out the difficulty. So that that's where questions about authorship uh, begin to arise. I mean, there, there are more complexities than that. And um, so... Being uh, the the tendency is to point then to uh, things that seem to be irregularities or inconsistencies in the text that lead uh, that lead people to suspect that these t- texts come from different sources and they've just been slammed together uh, and you know just sort of glued informally together without making a serious effort to give them a good consistency hmm. um, and um, <clears throat> so. The um, from the translator's point of view, uh, first of all, in order to be an honest translator, if there is a problem that's visible in the Hebrew, uh, it's not our job to hide it from the English reader. Um, but of course, the you know the 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 prior question of well, what actually constitutes a difficulty or a problem? I mean, that's that's not a that's not purely a translator's question. That's more of a critical thinking type of question. Um, and um, so, uh, for I mean, one of the classic examples is in Genesis 1, the deity is God, uh, Elohim in Hebrew. And then starting in Genesis 2 and verse 4, it's the Lord God, uh, Adonai Elohim in, in Hebrew. Um, and so it's suggested that uh, these two passages come from different sources. They're different tellings of the creation narrative, and somebody has just slammed them together. Uh, and the fact that, that we can detect this discontinuity is evidence of the less than fully competent slamming together uh, on, on the part of the editor. So it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be right for a translator to disguise any of that. Uh, it's right for the translator to pass on to the English reader what the Hebrew reader sees. Uh, and so then it becomes the job of the expositor to decide what to do about it. Um, now, I, now, I don't find any difficulty in it myself, but, but some people do. Um, and so as a translator, we ought to let people see, okay, so what is it that, that people are fussing about here? In your translation work, when you ran into situations like that, was there ever the sense, especially coming from a perspective of you know, affirming the inspiration of Scripture and the canonicity, um, was there ever this temptation to kind of, yeah, smooth things over in a way that wouldn't be transparent to the original text, that in an effort to help people pastorally or apologetically to feel confident in the Bible? Well, um, you know, people sent us mail, uh, and so they, they asked us to do things like that, mm. uh, which... Uh, you know, we tried to give consideration to, you know, any serious suggestion, but 
but in the end, we never took any of those kinds of suggestions because we felt that we would be violating our responsibility as, as translators. Um, and, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is, is that most of us, probably all of us, felt that there are reasonable ways of looking at these things that don't involve uh, doubt towards the scripture and towards the way it was composed. Mm. So another apologetic-related issue that kind of ties into this is a question of the morality of the Old Testament, uh, that in, in certain passages in the Old Testament, it seems like God's people are, they do some terrible things, sometimes even at God's command. And I would imagine as a translator, there there were probably would theoretically be ways to translate the Old Testament text to maybe make it less uh, less unpalatable to a modern ear. Was that ever an issue that you guys had to wrestle with in your work? Uh, mostly no, but uh, um, the, the, the question of how do we render the different words in Hebrew and in Greek for servant or slave came up, uh, and um, we, we discussed that, I think it was in 2010, um, you know, after the ESV had been out for a while, we, we wanted to revisit that and, and make sure that we had done the right thing. And we found a few places where, where we could modify uh, our, our translation, not so much in order to um, remove the difficulty, but to make a little bit more clear what was going on. And so we've added, there, there's some discussion in the preface to the ESV and their various footnotes, especially in the New Testament. The, the uh, term doulos is often translated bondservant, uh, in the New Testament, um, so so to make it a little bit more clear what what's going on, it's it's often the case that at least for a a person who is of European culture like I am, the word slave evokes the the African slave trade, um, and you know that it, that is a problem, and it is it is certainly true that people have used the biblical terminology as a way of justifying the African slave trade, uh, and none of us on the ESV translation committee thought that that was a legitimate use of the Bible. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, there's only so much you can do with the translation of an English word. There, there, we, we don't have a good English word that renders exactly the nuance, especially of the Hebrew word. Servant oftentimes seems too weak. It it's appropriate at some places, but sometimes it just feels too weak. Slave might be appropriate at some times, but it often feels too strong um, because the idea is that for the person who is a, a servant in Hebrew, um, it's it's your labor that belongs to somebody else. Uh, it's not your person. Um, and, you know, so there there's a difference there between slavery as we're familiar with it uh, in especially in the New World, um, practiced throughout the New World by the European powers and, and so forth. Mm. Um, and, you know, again, there's only so much you can do when the language you're translating into is English. Uh, and so sometimes you have to add some explanatory material, as we have done, uh, for example, in the preface. Yeah. So a final issue that I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about is, uh, relates to this question of reading and understanding the Bible literally. Uh, that word, literal, is, is probably a pretty contested word among some Christians, and it's, it's used in different ways, and, and yet it has to have an impact on the work of actually translating uh, the Bible. Uh, you yourself have done a lot of work uh, uh, in the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 to 3, and, and written a lot about that creation account and how to understand that account uh, literally. So I wonder if you could just help us understand um, uh, how would you understand or define the word literal when it comes to reading the Bible or translating the Bible, and how does that impact uh, the work of a translator? Right. Well, the, um, the, the term literal in classic discussions of hermeneutics, so we're talking about discussions that are coming out of the ancient church and then the Middle Ages and then coming up to the Reformation period, uh, and the contest between the uh, Reformation and uh, Catholicism and so forth, um, the, the notion of literal is the sense that the author intended and the sense that, that would have been perceived by a competent original audience. Um, 
And so, I mean, that's, that's the notion of literal, sometimes called the historical meaning. Um, and then the other senses, like the allegory, for example, to use, say, a story in Judges about the decline of Israel as an allegory for the decline of the soul and so forth, that's, those are other uses. So th those are the kinds of discussions that, that give us the terminology that, that we're used to. Um, nowadays, sometimes uh, what you get is... Uh, f literal is understood in what I would consider to be literalistic. So uh, Jesus tells his followers not to take an oath. Um, and so the literalistic application of that would be visible in certain um, Christian groups where they will not take an oath. Um, and uh, so that's that, that uh, that, that, that's for them that that's considered to be strict adherence to the words of Jesus. Help uh, speak to the person listening to that that example even right there, uh, obviously from the New Testament. But and they say, how would you how do you distinguish between a literal in interpretation of that and a literalistic one? What you just called literalistic feels like a very normal literal interpretation. Yeah. Well, uh, you ask, okay, so what was the statement of Jesus doing in its original context, and and uh, what would that have communicated? Um, and so the, the context is talking about ordinary day-to-day -day, uh, interaction, and it shouldn't require an oath on my part uh, for, for you to trust me. Um, what we need is, I mean, and this, this is what Jesus is concerned to produce, is a, a social system amongst his followers where it, everything is built on trust and trustworthiness um, so that I don't have to assure you so me to you, Matt, um, that, uh, you know, that I was fully sober during the whole time of, of working on the ESV translation. I shouldn't have to assure you uh, of that with an oath. You know, may God strike me dead uh, if at any time I was in an altered state of consciousness. Um, you should, ideally, you and I should be able to trust one another that if I tell you that it was so, uh, that, that you would have confidence and not need an oath uh, to to instill that confidence. So I mean that, and that's the sort of thing that Jesus was talking about. And so then you would look, and to prove that you would look at Jesus's own behavior, um, and the behavior of his followers, uh, as you know, as they're put under oath and and so forth. And you realize, okay, yeah, I, I I can see that what we do is ask, what was he doing in that particular context? What would that look like in another context? Well, maybe not necessarily exactly that. Mm. So the context really helps to inform how we understand what the author's meaning was. Um, and so how would this whole conversation then about uh, understanding a passage literally versus, you know, figuratively or literalistically on the other side, how would that inform or um, help you in the actual translation work uh, from ancient Hebrew? Um, well, again, um, it's mostly a matter of not wanting to take out of the hands of the English reader the responsibility to decide what to do with the text. Um, the, I mean, the thing is that the Greek readers uh, of the Gospels have the same issue. Okay, so what was this prohibition from Jesus doing in its context? They have the same issue um, as you and I do as we read this in English. Um, and the Hebrew readers would have had similar issues. Um, so, for example, in the Pentateuch, there are commands to wipe out the the Canaanite population, um, and um, they they those commands sound like they're take no prisoners. Um, and uh, in linguistics, there's an area um, called uh, linguistic pragmatics, where you're looking at what's the function of words in their context. What do people? What are people trying to do with their words? Uh, well, um, <clears throat> when you look, and, and you would apply that by looking at what Israel did when they spared various people. For example, they spared Rahab and her family. And guess what? Uh, the Lord actually approved of that sparing. So that, that tells you that, um, that those commands that sound so categorical actually have their, their unstated uh, but very real exceptions. Mm. Uh, you can make an exception if somebody from the indigenous population comes over to your side. Um, so, uh, 
that's but but that's that's linguistic pragmatics it's not my job as a translator to spell that out for you mm. my job as a translator is to let you see what's there in the writing um, in linguistics the locution that's the thing that you know the actual form of words and that's my job as a translator is to convey the locution the the force of these words is called the illocution uh, and as a translator, I have to be careful about importing my understanding of the illocution into the translation. Mm -hmm. That's that crosses a line. Yeah, but so how would you respond to the, the someone saying? But how can you separate those two things from each other? Because to to actually accurately translate the meaning of a given word or passage, the it, the locutions from Hebrew into English. You need to actually understand what they're saying and interpret to some extent what's going on there. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you do your best. I mean, that that's that's really you know there, there is no straightforward answer other than you do your best. Yeah. I mean, there are places. Look, um, you know, when when Jesus looks at somebody and feels compassion for him, and the literal rendering of the Greek is his bowels moved. Um, you're not going to translate that into his bowels move because that will mislead the English reader, uh, and it's and it gives you something gross. Um, and um, so there are this. We're coming back to uh, uh, system optimization here. Uh, there are trade-offs uh, to be had. Um, in First uh, Corinthians seven and verse one, uh, Paul is apparently quoting the Corinthians who think that it's good for a man not to touch a woman and that term touch is uh, probably a, a euphemism for touch sexually uh, and there's good argument for that um, but uh, but some translations have gone further and rendered Paul as saying it's good for a man not to marry um, and that's that's just gone too far mm. um, and so th there are times when you have to sort of give a little bit more interpretation in order to avoid a bad misreading um, and as long as you can keep them down to a minimum and as, and as long as you can keep as close to the original as possible without going too far then then you're still keeping keeping true to your translation philosophy yeah yeah that's really helpful uh, so what would you say are some uh, common misconceptions about the work of a translator, and maybe in particular the work of translating the Old Testament that you've often encountered over your years as a professor and a pastor and, and a teacher? Yeah. Well, sometimes people think, oh, you're a translator. That means you know everything <laughs> uh, about uh, about everything in, in the biblical text. And uh, no, we're, uh, all of us have specialized in order to get our PhDs. Uh, and so we're, we're working very hard to learn you know more about other things but um and, and the thing is that this this was one of the best blessings that, that came out of working on a committee uh w with with my fellow workers on the old testament committee for example i, I came to appreciate you know the pauline image of the body we don't all do the same thing because we're not all good at the same things um and so the in our phd work we we were uh, we were instilled with this notion that, well, I'm omnicompetent, and I'm the only authority on this, and everybody else is wrong. Um, and <laughs> it, if you're working on a team, um, it's really helpful to to recognize, oh, yeah, so Dr. House or Dr. Wenham, uh, Dr. Williams, you know, they, they actually see stuff that I don't see. Uh, they, they have a background that I don't have, and I can add something that they don't see, but, you know, we can actually... Um, bring the contribution of the team and the, the team's contribution is greater than the sum of the individual parts. I mean, it, it's a, at least in my estimation, that's uh, what we have in, in the ESV. So the, the, you know, just the whole notion of, of being um, sort of a one man show uh, who knows everything is utterly defeated by trying to do a, a serious job of translating the Bible. Yeah. Um, and, and anybody who translates the Bible as a one-man show is asking for trouble. Well, Jack, thank you so much for taking time today to talk with us about uh, just all the, the many facets that go into translating the Old Testament into English, into a language that, that many of us uh, de depend on having it in. Uh, it's such valuable work for us, and uh, we appreciate it.
Well, thanks for having me, and and, uh, I hope you'll encourage your audience not simply to read the Bible, but try reading it aloud and encourage uh, their their churches to read it aloud and uh, even in unison as much as possible. Mm. Uh, uh, Sort of recapture something about the nature of the Bible as as this God's word for God's people as they're assembled to honor God and to listen to his voice. Mm. Amen. That was Jack Collins on Translating the Old Testament. To learn more about the English Standard Version, we invite you to visit esv.org translation. To find the ESV Bible edition that's right for you, visit crossway.org Bibles. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crosswhite is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.